Now I'm going to do the, the reverse of Katina. So it's my pleasure to introduce our MC for the evening, Associate Professor Katina Michael, who is a board member of the Australian Privacy Foundation and Associate Dean International in the University's Faculty of Engineering and Information Sciences. Thank you, Judy. Act one. Jonathan, Jonathan, no. I know it says on telly that there's a glass and a half of milk in that chocolate bar, but it's got other stuff in it too. Look, look at the list. Mum said broccoli, carrots. What? What? Luke! Luke! What, Sophie? He's, he's in the next aisle with biscuits all over his face. Oh, no, we've got to put that in the basket as well. Mum's going to kill us. Where's the money coming from? Frozen foods, frozen things, rice bubbles and everything. What? No, Jonathan, we can't go to Hungry Mac Jackie's. No, Sophie. No, forget about Colonel Pizza Hut. Oh, these kids are going to drive me nuts. Oh, the state of origin's on tomorrow. I've got to get the meat pies. No, don't do it. Don't give in. Channel Bridget Kelly. Bridget? Bridget! Imagine this newborn child. When this child was born, we can consider them to be a relatively clean slate. Of course, the genetics that they inherit from their parents will influence their physical characteristics, their intelligence and their disease risk. But when it comes to establishing lifelong eating patterns, childhood is a critical period that will influence this child's growth and immediate and long-term health outcomes. This child and all children have been born with powerful self-regulatory controls over their food intake. This means that up until around the middle of childhood, internal hormonal signals will guide the amount of food that this child consumes based on their energy needs. This self-regulation of eating is broken down by parent feeding practices, such as forcing children to eat everything on their plate, and importantly, by external cues to eat from our environment. And this environment in modern westernised societies is characterised by an abundant availability of inexpensive, highly processed, highly palatable and energy-dense foods that are sold in large and convenient packages and are heavily promoted. And this bombardment with messages about unhealthy food and drinks and constant opportunities to consume these foods overrides children's self-regulation of eating and can lead to overconsumption and weight gain over time. Our most recent population data indicate that one in every four children are overweight or obese in Australia. And this represents a doubling of childhood overweight and a trebling of childhood obesity in the last three decades. Now, clearly, there's been no change to our genetic code in this relatively short time period which highlights the role of our environment as a major driver to changes to our diet and our weight status. Food marketing in particular has been pointed out as a main contributor to our obesogenic or obesity-promoting environments. We know that food marketing has an influence on children's food intakes that's similar to other social determinants, such as family, peers, and socioeconomic status. But these factors are not so easy to change. There is increasing research and evidence about how we can impact on food marketing to children to restrict children's exposure to this advertising and to protect children from this environment. Children, uh, particularly those less than eight years of age, are thought to be vulnerable to the effects of marketing and this is because of their relatively immature cognitive development and lack of experience, which makes them less critical of advertising and means that they tend to view commercial messages as truthful and unbiased. But even at older ages, we know that food companies use techniques to engage older children, and the, the way that modern marketing works is through the use of intensely sophisticated and integrated campaigns to hook children and young people in. If we imagine a day in the life of a typical child, we know from research in Australia and also internationally 
the children are exposed to commercial messages for unhealthy food in all aspects of their daily lives through all media that they engage with. So, for example, we know that children are engaged, uh, exposed to food marketing on food packages, and you'll note the branded character on the Frosties cereal box. In outdoor advertising around schools, where there's almost twice as many advertisements for unhealthy food in the area, in the immediate vicinity of schools, compared to slightly further away. While they're at school, through branded signage on vending machines in high schools, or branded learning materials. On their way home from school, where they're encouraged to go to fast food outlets via signage, and incidentally, these restaurants are more frequently placed in areas of greater social deprivation, through the sponsorship of their own sports clubs or the sport that they watch on TV, while they're watching television, where children see an average of nine unhealthy food advertisements for every hour of TV that they watch during their most popular programs. When they're reading children's magazines, where two-thirds of all references to food are unhealthy, including product placements like this one. And lastly, in social media, where the children themselves act as brand Uh, branding tools, where they're encouraged to promote product, products to children through those peer-to-peer -peer interactions by liking and connecting with pages and posts. We know that the, the foods that children prefer are those that they, that they are familiar with, and those that they tend to, uh, tend to ignore are those that are less familiar to them. And this constant reinforcement of unhealthy products means that these products are normalised as part of children's everyday lives, it encourages brand loyalty, and it contributes to overconsumption of these foods. It's little wonder, then, that we're seeing such escalating rates of obesity across the world when children are brought up in environments such as these. <coughs> obesity is typically considered to be an individual issue. To be the responsibility of a single person, or in the case of, ch of children, their parents. But an alternative and more equitable view is that obesity is a societal issue that is now commonplace because of the way that we structure the world around us, including our food environments. This then means that it's the responsibility of all of us to contribute to a society that supports healthy behaviours, and allows children to grow and develop away from the influence of the fat food environment. Public health experts and leading health agencies argue that the obesity epidemic and increasing rates of diet-related chronic diseases that we're seeing is mostly to blame, or at least uh, as a large contributor, is the food industry. And they believe that the food industry should be held to account and that there's, there's a need for stronger government legislation to prevent the swamping of our food systems by unhealthy foods and their heavy promotion. But despite this recognised need for action, there has been really no affirmative action by government in Australia or internationally to limit children's exposure to this unhealthy food marketing. And one of the main reasons for that is the perceived lack of evidence that directly links food marketing to post-consumption effects or changes in diet and weight behaviours. So to better demonstrate this cause and effect relationship between exposure to food marketing and weight gain, we've developed a model to show the outcomes of food marketing across multiple levels, which we've referred to as the cascade of effects framework. So really what this model shows is that exposure to marketing influences children's awareness of products and brands, just as I've been saying. It influences their attitudes to products and foods, which is reinforced over time with repeated exposures. Upon exposure to cues of, to purchase a product at the point of sale or through, through outdoor advertising, this leads to intentions to purchase a product and purchasing of a product which is either done um, by the child themselves or through pester power, so asking their parents to buy the product for them. This leads to subsequent consumption of foods, which is not compensated for, energy imbalance over time, and weight gain ultimately. So we've shown this model as a linear progression, 
but it's likely that later parts of this model are reinforced, uh, so reinforced, sorry, earlier levels. So for example, consumption of a product may increase the likelihood that children will enjoy that product and, and prefer that brand, okay, particularly where that's consumed in particular social settings or occasions. So it, most likely, the true causal relationship between marketing exposure and childhood of overweight and obesity is likely to be much more complex. But nevertheless, what this model shows is that there is a sequenced set of effects between exposure to marketing and childhood obesity that can be demonstrated through research. And we can also use this model to provide robust scientific evidence to policymakers to support the development of legislation to protect children from this food marketing. So in closing, this issue of the fat food environment is not only an issue for Australia and other developed countries. We live in a, highly, uh, we live in a world with a highly globalised food supply, where about 30% of our food comes from just the top 10 multinational food companies. And these large corporations make their huge profits by focusing on the emerging middle classes uh, of developing countries. So in our public health efforts to improve food environments in, in, poor, in richer countries, we also need to make sure that we're focusing our attention on poor countries as well. And our research has shown that some of these issues that I've been talking about, and particularly junk food marketing to children, is an even more prevalent issue in, in emerging economies. The food industry is big business. And the lucrative status quo is unlikely to change unless governments require this industry to do so. So I urge you to show outrage about this issue, to lobby our MPs for change, and together, let's contribute to a society that's healthy and equitable. Thank you.